Hi, uh, my name is Brooke Watts. I'm a general internist at the Cleveland VA. I'm the chief quality officer and an associate professor of medicine. My talk today is on hot spotting. Um, this is uh, particularly relevant because there's uh, more and more emphasis on methods to control cost and improve quality of care, um, especially in the context of value-based purchasing. She completed her undergraduate training at Rice University in Houston, Texas, then went on to complete her MD at the University of Alabama School of Medicine in Birmingham, Alabama. She then moved on to complete her residency and chief residency at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and her master's in science in health policy at Case Western Reserve University. She is well known to the House staff and has received several awards for teaching excellence. She serves on a variety of local, regional, and national committees, including serving as the co-chair of the Clinical Advisory Committee for Better Health Greater Cleveland, a Robert Wood Johnson-funded regional health collaborative. She currently is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine and in Epidemiology and Biostatistics at Case Western Reserve University, as well as the Chief Quality Officer at Lewis Stokes Cleveland Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center. She is the principal investigator on several grants, including most recently a program to address the needs of high-risk patients via an intensive management program. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Watts for today's discussion is Hot Spotting Spot On, Lessons Learned from Implementing a Program to Address High Utilizers. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Dr. Walls, Dr. Armitage, for having me. And this is a fun talk, at least I think so. Um, how many people have heard about hot spotting? Yeah. How many people think they might be interested in hot spotting? So. <laughs> Dr. Haney raised his hand. That's always very good sign. Very good sign. Um, I, I, you know, this is this is a catchy topic. This is really is hot right now. This is something a lot of people are talking about. They're talking about it because it has to do with money, which we're going to talk about. But I think there's some interesting pieces of it that that might be food for thought. A lot of unanswered questions, but maybe some things that can have you go home and think a little more. Hey guys. <laughs> okay. So um, I realized that I needed to take a moment and explain where the money was coming for this project. And I think this is important because you, most of you probably realize there's still not that many funding situations in medicine that push us against using things like acute care and hospitalizations, right? We still get reimbursed for the most part for those episodes of care. So it's important to understand a little bit about where this money is coming from. This money comes from the VA. It's part of something they call a patient intensive management program. This is a very large grant of which we are one site. The other sites are in San Francisco, Atlanta, Milwaukee, and a rural site in North Carolina. And they've given us what I think is a quite a generous amount of money to spend four years trying to figure out if we can reduce utilization and reduce cost for a certain group of high-risk patients. The evaluation core for this project is being run by Lisa Rubenstein. And I know there are people like Dr. Chandra in the room who know who Dr. Rubenstein is. She is um, a really a national and international expert in health policy. She's most famous for her work through the RAND Foundation. And I think it's just, um, it just shows, I guess, what kind of emphasis the VA is putting on these programs. And that they think that the things that we're going to learn from these are probably generalizable to other situations. And Dr. Rubenstein's involvement is really a sign of that because she bridges both the VA and the private sector. A couple moments about context. VHA is not the VBA, we're not the people that process the claims, we're the people that provide the health care. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't end up in the news a lot too, but just a clarification. The VA is the largest integrated health care system in the U.S. We have 150 medical centers, a whole lot of outpatient clinics, a whole lot of providers, and we serve a little more than 8 million patients a year. Our, our budget is $55 billion. And for the purposes of this room, a little reminder that we are the largest provider of graduate medical education in the United States. So thank you to the teachers out there. Hi, Ron and Rod. So 
the funny thing about the VA, or not funny, or maybe the interesting thing for those of us that are interested in health policy, is that it functions as an accountable care organization. We get a budget. So we get a plunk of money. We have all these providers, these patients, and that's what we have to take care of them. So things in the VA that lower cost, that improve quality, that keep people out of the hospital, even if they seem strange or different, are financially feasible and, in fact, encouraged. And this means that over the last few years, some of the things that we think of as being a little bit more... <laughs> okay. Scott, do you want me to switch mics? This mic is... Do you want me to try this one? We'll try this. Okay. So some of the things that we think of as being a little progressive in healthcare, which is basically new models of care, different, thinking of different ways that we can deliver care, are sometimes really hard to do in healthcare settings where it's a fee-for-service model. And that isn't a challenge that the VA has. So we were, we've had patients in our medical homes for five years. We do a lot of new, other kinds of new models like shared medical visits and telehealth. Um, for the Cleveland VA alone, we did 20,000 telehealth visits last year. This includes you know, everything from just calling up patients in their home to taking pictures with cameras and emailing them so that people don't wait for a dermatologist. All of this has been possible because of, of how our healthcare is financed. Um, and this gives us an opportunity to think about this kind of program. Okay. So that's the context for, for why the, the VA might be interested in doing this. So what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about why this is such a hot topic. I'm going to go over the evidence. You're going to leave with a lot of questions about the evidence, about definitions. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what I'm doing locally. I'm going to put a caveat on my local project right now. We've been getting patients for three months. So when I say early lessons learned, I mean really early lessons learned. And then we'll talk about where this is going. Okay, so why this topic? Why hot spotting? I think it probably got momentum from an AHRQ brief that came out um, a little more than four years ago. And what is sugar spritz? How many, I'm curious, how many of you have seen this picture before? Okay, Dr. Gravenson says yes. So, See this tiny little sliver right there, that light blue line? So this says that 1% of the U.S. population accounts for 20% of healthcare costs, okay? 1% is 20% of healthcare costs. This next little blue bar there, so that's 5%. 5% of the population accounts for 50% of healthcare costs. So most of this, 50% of us, in fact, account for only 5% of healthcare costs. So 1%, 20% of healthcare costs, 5%, 50% of healthcare costs. It is impossible to be someone who thinks about health policy or worries even about how you fund a healthcare system or a hospital, not to wonder what can you do, whether does it make more sense to try to figure out what's going on in this 5% that might account for 50% of your healthcare costs. Because if you could do something about that 5%, it might have a tremendous impact. So this uh, data is not that new. The HRQ group probably summarized it in a way and got more attention than others. But the real interest comes because the reimbursement models for the private sector are changing. And I talked a little bit about how the VA is structured. So you could see how the VA might be interested in something that might be able to reduce costs and improve care. But what about everybody else? Reimbursement models are changing. There's penalties for readmissions and discharge, you know, free, um, quality of discharges and of course accountable care organizations and you know basically what an accountable care organization means is that you end up responsible for the care of that patient in a way that um, is linked to a package as opposed to an individual's fee for service payment so this is an, uh, even the hot spotter the word is new who, who coined hot spotters does anybody even know it came from that Atul Gawande article. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's the same thing that we said when I was a resident. We used to call them frequent flyers. Now I think sometimes they're hot spiders, these super utilizers. 
Um, and really, again, we've been focusing on this idea of cough without them because it's easy to spot. It's easy to, to figure out who's costing a lot of money from our reimbursement data. But I wanted to make the point that when people cost a lot, it's usually due to um, acute care utilization. So when we talk, for example, about decreasing costs in a high-risk patient, what you're generally talking about is not more or less primary care visits. What you're talking about is less emergency room visits and less acute care hospitalizations, okay? All right. So let's look at what evidence is out there on these kinds of programs. Um, the first we'll talk about is Medicare. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the Medicaid programs, specifically the Camden Project, which I suspect some of you are familiar with. I think it's important to note here, or notice, and I think you'll see the theme, that there's not been very much of this done yet in the private, in some of what we think of the traditional private sector market, markets, and it has to do, again, with this reimbursement story. Okay, so um, this is from a paper that was published in JAMA in 2009, um, and what they did um, over a period that started around 2002 is they uh, focused on fee-for-service Medicare patients that had heart failure, diabetes, chronic, chronic, common chronic disease. They did a randomized trial. It was intent to treat 15 sites through your program. You were incentivized to care for these patients. They used nurses who uh, provided primarily over the phone patient education. And the nurses averaged about two contacts per patient. Um, they ended up rolling about 18,000 patients. I make the point that these nurses were located remotely, so they were mostly in California, and were calling patients. So they weren't necessarily, they can't call them an integrated part of the care team. Um, and what they showed was that this didn't work very well. Uh, 13 of the 15 programs didn't show any kind of improvement. Um, whether you looked at hospitalizations or costs, the patients really didn't notice it, didn't like it, and the improvements that were seen in the other two programs were really quite negligible. This was a lot of money. This was a big investment in Medicare. It went on for several years um, and didn't show a lot of improvement. But leave it to academic medicine to give it another, another whirl. So uh, Wash U in St. Louis, um, whose initial project that was funded as part of this um, Medicare program, showed a 12% increase in total spending, decided to try again. And they talked Medicare into giving them an extension and a little bit more money and see if they could figure it out this time. So what they did, um, rather than using these remote bank of nurses who were calling patients at home, was they um, tried to emphasize um, particularly high-risk patients, which they were starting to focus in on as people who were being admitted a lot or emergency room visits, which is a little different than a chronic care management population. And they were located locally, so they um, had opportunities to engage with provider teams. Providers would know who they were. They actually saw the patients. And um, what they saw um, was over a couple of years that they were able to reduce hospitalizations by about 12% and to see about a 10% reduction in spending. And most interestingly, they noticed that the highest risk group, again, the highest risk group being people who are using a lot of acute care, drove the results. Um, this, was very, this paper was published in 2012, which was very timely because the work of uh, the Camden Project um, was also starting to come into the, the popular consciousness. So here's that famous picture from the New Yorker back in 2011. Um, this is a really unfortunate looking individual with a price tag of 3.5 million on it. This wasn't an arbitrarily chosen price tag. This was actually the cost of a particular patient who was being cared for in Camden to an insurance, the insurance company over the course of two years. Um, does anybody know, uh, Camden's famous for a couple things. Does anybody know what Camden is probably most famous for? <laughs> is that true? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Camden is famous for having the highest murder rate in the country. <laughs> Camden um, also has 95% uh, of its patient population. Yours was much more positive than mine. <laughs> um, it's challenging. So 95%. It's, Camden's a small place. We're talking less than 100,000 patients. Doctor, you know, while the ACO that you have here is double the size of, of the population of Camden. 
They have about uh, 100,000 residents, highest murder rate in the country. 95% of their residents are covered by Medicaid. So remember, Medicaid is what you get on when you're poor. So it makes for an interesting challenge in healthcare, but it also makes an interesting opportunity. And there was a, um, a physician called, uh, named, or there is a physician, I should say, Jeffrey Brenner, um, who's made his name um, first in thinking about data, which is what I really find so interesting about this project. So Jeffrey Brenner um, was in, he was originally going to be a, like a PhD neuroscientist, and then he did some rotations in medical school um, where he was taking care of patients, and he describes being in a very high risk clinic, it was like a, an immigrant population, Spanish speaking, with a lot of social problems, and he found it to be the most intellectually challenging thing he'd ever done. So he went from going in a very sort of, what we think of a very aggressive sort of a cognitive, you know, kind of path to being something that really incorporated the cognitive components of social service, and he did a family practice residency and started practicing, opened up a practice in Camden. And uh, one of the things that he became very interested in was the ways in which the city of New York um, was starting to map where high crime areas were. So this was in the, well, maybe a decade ago now. So they were using data on crime statistics, they were making maps, and they were trying to decide where you put police officers based on where your crime is. And he had this, what seems now to be perfectly reasonable, that was sort of very revolutionary at the time, that maybe we could do the same thing for healthcare. And in particular, this was possible in Camden because everybody used Medicaid. So rather than something that we might try to do in other areas where you're trying to pick and choose data from a variety of sources, um, he had really a very focused group. And um, he started mapping, and he figured out where high-cost patients were likely to be. And he um, started talking to more and more people and wanted to build a social structure, a structure for providing care for these patients, even though they were very complicated. And he ended up um, getting a MacArthur uh, Foundation Genius Grant um, out of the deal, which I'm sure helps. I think that's probably be the first thing anybody says about him for the rest of his life, is that he got a Genius Award. Um, he also just happens to be a very nice guy. And um, I know he's um, worked with Dr. Gravenstein's team. He's consulted on our project, been willing to take phone calls, answer emails, and I just have to say as a side, that was really um, something that's been very refreshing. He's a true believer. He, he really thinks we can make a difference in the world. Um, so they did this project. They, um, as documented by Atul Gawande in the New Yorker, they showed that sick people were clustered in particular areas and that the costs were really high. And um, in a retrospective um, paper that was published in the Health Policy Literature, they looked specifically at 36 super users. And these were people defined in the way that I'm describing to you as a lot of acute care utilization. Um, these 36 uh, super users accounted for 1.2 million in costs every year. So they had this little intensive management program, which in the beginning he had on a very small budget, which I'll show you in a minute, and very limited staff. But they worked with these patients over a period of, of um, the first project was a little bit longer, I think in the neighborhood of nine to 12 months. And they were able to show an absolute cost reduction of almost $700,000, uh, which was primarily driven by this decrease in acute care utilization. His budget for that project was very, very, very small. So if you are someone who's, again, interested in these sorts of things, this is the kind of thing that gets a lot of attention. So why then, why wouldn't we all go out and do this? We can all do this, we can lower our costs. So here are some of the things to think about um, as we go through this kind of discussion. So there's some challenges with the cost driven definition. And uh, Dr. Sarah Augustine might remember this a couple, maybe three years ago, right after the original um, Atul Gawande article came back out, she and I pulled a list of uh, the highest cost patients to the VA. And we were sort of interested in this idea that maybe we could do something about it. So we pulled the highest cost list. We saw the first patient, you know, tremendous, huge, several million dollar cost. We looked them up. And it was a gentleman who had very unfortunately had a large heart attack and had been hospitalized for seven months. He actually ended up doing well, but boy, it cost a lot of money. There's nothing an intensive management program could do about that. The next several patients on the list 
for all patients receiving chemotherapy. So antibody-driven therapies that were very expensive, the darn it. Or anything we're going to do about that, that's appropriate cost utilization. So you have to think a little bit about this cost of de definition. I, I, I'm trying to make the distinction here, I hope you're getting it, that there's, if you want to do this kind of work, or you want to think about this kind of work, that there's some nuances to how you might find or approach the population. So um, it's this appropriate versus inappropriate utilization. Uh, one of the challenges we see is that patients who have a lot of frequent visits often tend to be patients who are getting rehabilitation, physical therapy, post and knee replacement. Um, cancer chemotherapies, those are appropriate utilizations. A reminder that sometimes it's easy to start thinking about this cost number because those numbers are so pretty. I mean, if you think about what Camden showed, you start really thinking about cost, but is this our goal? Is it our goal? Is it our goal to improve cost or reduce cost or improve care? And what we learned is that health care costs, high cost patients tend to be a very heterogeneous group. Um, Jeffrey Brenner says, told us that there was probably about 200 phenotypes he'd identified, which are variable consistencies of appropriate and inappropriate use. There's also a lot of challenges because some of the things that we think of as very high cost, like dialysis, um, have ethical implications associated with them. And so how do you make those determinations from a larger programmatic, systematic thing? Or what kinds of costs are one-time or recurring, which is really the example of the patient I described to you had the seven-month hospitalization. This um, table is taken from the insurance literature, and I, it really makes the point that a lot of things I think that we think of as high cost, so these are the most high cost conditions, simply aren't things that could be addressed by the kinds of programs that we're talking about. So these are the things that cost the insurance companies the most money. If you look down the list, you can see that there's some things that you might trigger into saying that they might get better over the long term with primary care, but it's certainly not things that are amenable to intensive management types of programs. Um, this is also shown in a paper that was published in JAMA about a year and a half ago that looked at 1.1 1 .1, um, million Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. And um, they used uh, some of the modeling that we use for ambulatory sensitive conditions um, that some of you are familiar with. And they looked at ED visits and hospitalizations to see what seemed preventable or not preventable. And it was very depressing. Um, there's, uh, for the things that cost the most, so the dark bars you see are things that they were calling as potentially um, preventable in this Medicare population. And as you can see, there really are only a few things. The bulk of what they're describing were things that um, did not appear to be preventable costs. And it's funny when I look at it, I always, um, you know, there's things on here that you, you, they're calling them preventable based on these models, but it doesn't make a lot of um, intuitive sense to me. They're things that don't um, seem that they would be the impact of much broader kinds of changes in the care model. Okay. And, um, I'll admit I gave this talk somewhere else before, and they asked me about something, so I dropped in an extra slide <laughs> to answer the question. Um, the, the question I got was about end-of-life care, and you know, isn't this about control? When you think about controlling costs, maybe it would make sense to really target things to um, for all those high costs that we know people get into in the last few months of their life. And um, Dr. Ezekiel who published a piece in the New York Times that was very helpful in trying to answer this question, what he's saying is that, um, yes, 6% of Medicare patients account for 30% of costs, but this hasn't changed in decades, which I thought was very interesting. So 6% account for 30% of the costs. This hasn't changed. In other words, we think about that high cost from all those things that we do at the end of life, but that really isn't any different than it's ever been. Does that make sense? It's not getting worse. And um, the total number of Americans who die each year, about 1% of the population, account for about 10 to 12% of healthcare spending. So indeed, it's there, but it's not, when you think about it in a larger context, um, it's not entirely clear there's a ton of savings there. And that doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do, right, to think about how we improve care, lower costs at the end of life, but it might not be that magic pill that switches that 5%, 50% equation that we were looking at earlier. Okay, um, okay so that's 
the Medicare, that's Camden. What else is there out there on hot spotting? I've told you it's not new. There's got to be something, right? There's really not very much. There's lots of really nice little papers that are case studies, anecdotes of people who really felt that they did something for a patient, were able to connect in a way that they couldn't before. There's not a lot of true, um, what we would call high quality evidence. There was a one large review of the literature that was published um, in 2013. It was not even in the realm of a meta-analysis. It was what's called an evidence brief, which means they just basically to try to summarize what's out there. They found 20 papers that met some very loose inclusion criteria. Um, 13 were observational, seven were RCTs, and essentially all of them were before and after studies. So there was very, very little that looked at saying, okay, you take a high-risk population and you randomize them to these interventions and you watch what happens over time. Okay. They did, um, however, summarize, I thought, some interesting things in this paper. Um, they made a point which I think is very critical, especially as we think about how the discussions on this area go forward. There is a real lack of taxonomy in how we talk about these patient populations. Um, so, for example, when I say high-risk patients, what do I mean? I've tried to make an effort to explain that to you, but that might be different things for different folks. And when you uh, start to look at the literature, it becomes really clear that we may not be always talking about the same things. This gets really important because if you want to design interventions or understand what the evidence says about interventions to improve the care or decrease the cost for these populations, you have to know what you're talking about. And really, I think that that, that sort of unanswered question in taxonomy is very really important. They did also make a point of saying that they couldn't find any of these programs that, that reduce mortality, but, but, it didn't seem to make things any worse. <laughs> so that sort of the take-home message was, we can't tell you that these, you know, this isn't, doesn't seem to be saving lives. We're having a hard time describing what we're talking about. But it doesn't seem to make anything worse. So at least the door is open for continuing the discussion about this kind of work. They also um, brought up the GRACE program, which is res included as one of the two randomized control trials in the evidence brief. This is something that the geriatrics folks are very, I think, very, very familiar with. Um, and I wanted to just quickly show you a little bit of the GRACE data, because I think it's an interesting piece. GRACE was a randomized control trial. It stands for geriatric something in the elderly, geriatric assessment in the elderly. Um, what they did was, to, it was an uh, older population. Um, they wanted to see if they provided a lot of home-based care. So they did a home evaluation, patient went in the home, uh, social worker, nurse, work with the patient and family, a lot of care coordination uh, with the goal of keeping people out of the hospital or keeping them out of long-term care facilities. And what they showed is that they didn't get nearly, but for grace is in the light blue. This is from their paper on health affairs. Grace is in the light blue, usual care is in the red. They were not happy with their uh, results in year one, but in years two and three, they really saw a dramatic decrease in hospitalization. Um, and that actually translated, as we've talked about, to a decrease in cost. So not the first year, because they got the program going and you don't have that decreased acute care utilization, grace costs more than usual care. But if you hang on long enough, then you can see the cost benefit. And I think this, um, this the grace work really opened the door to the conversations about what kinds of things and how um, that we needed to think about as we started to do these interventions. Okay, so, oh, one more thing. I slipped this slide into. There's, um, I only found one paper really focusing on uh, this kind of work in the, because um, again, we're at we do academic medicine, so I wanted to think about this in educational settings. There's a couple of small pieces related to medical students. This is the only thing I found related to residents that was published in JGEM last year. Um, and if you, you know, look what they did, it's such a minor little thing to get a piece on JGEM, which I probably just speaks to the lack of evidence in this area. Um, they took 15 interns, they each got one frequent flyer, one high utilizing patient, one per intern. And they were sort of assigned to that patient for their intern year. And the idea was could, um, if you were sort of focusing on that patient and had this opportunity to potentially even do a home visit, how it work out, work out. So they had 10 of the interns that were actually able to make one home visit, which um, they described a lot of challenges in finding the patients. 
um, you know, in coordinating, getting a hold of them. And I think um, if you think about your most difficult patients, that might be easy to imagine how even if you tried really hard and you knew you wanted to publish this and you were doing a study, that you still might only actually manage a home visit with 10 out of 15 patients. Um, the, um, the summary, though, does say that the, the interns who, who did get to meet their patients and work with them thought it was really great. Um, we're not sure what else happened, but um, they at least liked the experience. <laughs> these are these anecdotes that I talked about. Okay. So that's, that's sort of the state of the evidence. So there's a lot of questions, a lot of gaps. So it makes sense to me going along that with both context and knowing where the evidence is of why the VA decided that they were going to funnel all this money in this program and hire Lisa Rubenstein to analyze it. And they were going to do it as a randomized controlled trial. Ack. Problem for me. Challenge. So if you're going to do this as a randomized controlled trial, they wanted to be able to assign us the patients, okay? So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. Because I know when you're sitting here thinking, you can think of these high-risk patients, these super users, you know their names. I can still remember one from my residency. Taught me how to take care of type 1 DKA. Um, but those aren't the patients we're getting. We're getting they're getting randomized. So our program locally is called ABC PATH, um, the Cleveland Intensive Management Program. ABC is Allies for Better Care. PACT is the VAPCMH model. Um, Make sense? Yes, okay. So we um, are using um, uh, the expanded chronic care model. This is, for those of you that are familiar with Wagner's work, this is just a way to say that we're thinking about how a healthcare population affects patients. If you ever go to write a health policy-esque grant, you'll need a picture like this. This is mine. This is our team. Um, so I told you we're getting randomized patients, okay? So we're getting randomized high-risk patients are being assigned to us. So we tried to build a team that we thought would be as flexible as possible to deal with the needs of these folks. So we have a program manager who is a former military medic, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in just a second. We have a nurse practitioner um, who primarily had experience in acute care, and I think she might be here somewhere. She's right there. Um, we have a psychology, a PhD psychologist. We have two former military medics who are making home visits and acting as health coaches. And then we have a variety of other folks who've been working with us, which has been very exciting. Our physician partners in the primary care, um, an MP who's doing some quality work right now. We have an evalu our own evaluation core, and we've been sort of picking up residents and students along the way. Um, this program for us, um, what's unique about the Cleveland site is that we have chosen to try to find uh, new roles for former military medics. And um, I, those of you who watch John Stewart probably have heard about this before, but the idea is that uh, medics who serve in the military, some who do very advanced sorts of things in the in theater, like in the conflict zones and in a variety of other environments, um, don't necessarily have any kind of credentialing when they come out in the private sector. And this has been a point of contention. So you can be the doc in Afghanistan and be out doing all sorts of things and be trained to do all sorts of things that we would all recognize as being very important experience. And you can do that for years and you come out to the private sector and you can't get a job. Um, and there are, obviously we're all interested in helping veterans to get jobs. We're also interested in thinking about how we could use those kind of healthcare skills um, to do things that maybe other people don't want to do. And we had a little bit of a joke um, when we started this program because a lot of our, you know, we're an urban center, Cleveland VA, and we sort of thought, well, you know, who wants to do home visits in the city of Cleveland? I mean, who, who really wants to do home visits in the city of Cleveland? We thought, well, maybe somebody who's been in Afghanistan <laughs> might, might think that this was a walk in the park. <laughs> so we, we, um, we actually had to build it. We built a job description. We made partnership with um, some really wonderful people through the military medic working group. Um, and we are a pilot site. We're the only place in the country right now that's doing this that is using military medics um, in a new way, uh, a different way. And that is primarily um, to make home visits. And we have at least one of our medics, I think, is here. Is she here? She's right back there. 
So these are, um, we hired uh, two veterans who are both military medics with some clinical expertise, and they're deploying in this new way as part of our intensive management team. So we have been getting patient um, patients now for about three months and this is how they're picking them and this is the something that I wanted uh, to spend a couple of moments on so we, they are using a risk-based model because we have to do, we want to do this randomized control trial and once you start to really think about this, you realize why there's been such a lack of evidence in this area. So you want to do this as a randomized control trial so we can't take referrals, right? Because, I mean, if you think about referrals as a method, it's fraught with a lot of things that are hard to define about a patient population that, to make it sure that it's extractable to other environments. So the VA has decided to use something called the Care Assessment Needs Score. If anybody with VA clinics, have you looked at this for your patient panel yet? Has anybody seen it? It's available for all VA patients, and it's that you actually can scan down your panel and see, see who has this high CAN score. It looks at the probability of omission or death within a specific time period, and it's expressed as a percentile, and basically tells you how likely, compared to other patients, a veteran is to be hospitalized or die within nine month, the next nine months or the next year. And it's quite good. Um, this is a paper that was published in Medical Care um, in 2013. And what you see is that the blue is the predicted rate from the model, and the orange is the observed rate for a variety of different populations. This is death, the 90-day 90, the 90 model, the one-year model. The different groups are the death without admission, admission, or admission or death. And you can see in every area, the model does pretty impressive job of gathering things. So people are asking what the model looks like. These are all the terms that go in the model. It becomes an interesting thing. Lots of stuff. If they throw all this in, out the other side comes something that's a pretty good chance of telling us hospitalization death, right? Predicted. Okay, here's the challenge. So even if you take the highest risk, so the top 5%, What is the average, what, what percent, five, of that 5%, so you're taking the top 5% of patients, the highest risk group, what percent actually has a hospitalization of, in 90 days? This is important, again, because we're thinking, we're using this for an intensive management program where we're trying to prevent hospitalization, we're trying to prevent people from coming in. So we want to be able to show a decrease in that number, right? That's what we want to do. So this highest 5%, so it's actually only 20% of the patients, okay? So it's really good at predicting it, right? But it's still a pretty small number that the event actually happens for. So what you're talking about is basically event rates. So you, need, you know, generally we like things that have higher event rates because you have a better chance that you're actually going to be able to show you impact is. And if you go down um, just to a CAN score of 95, so past this first five minutes, it's really, it's only 11% will have a hospitalization in the next three months. Okay. So what we've learned, what we've been getting, are these randomized li these lists that have been randomized, which have handed this list of patients. We've gotten 100 so far that all have very high CAN scores, so they have a high risk of hospitalization or death. We're being measured on whether or not we can present, primarily prevent their acute care utilization and what happens to their cost data. So we're getting handed these lists, and then what we're doing as an interdisciplinary team is we're going through them, trying to figure out what the heck we can do to show our outcomes. And these are the things that we're learning from the risk-based definition that it's good at predicting risk, but it seems to be giving us a whole lot of the wrong patients. Um, you saw all those crazy terms that are going in the model that I showed you, and what we're seeing is that patients who are old, patients who have advanced malignancy that are having a lot of visits, which is that appropriate versus inappropriate care that we talked about, um, that are using a lot of extensive services as part of a transition, you know, it's the kind of that end of life story, um, seems to be swept up in this risk model. And what that's not showing for us is things that we can get to at the right time. So it's the wrong time. Uh, the best example we had was the first patient on the second list we looked up had had multiple admissions for heart failure. We thought, okay, you know, we, can, we know what to do about that. We can do coordinated care, cardiology. You know, we can do telehealth, home weight monitoring. Oh, wait, he got a bad last week. <laughs> so that's, that, 
you know, that, so now he has a bad team that's following him on a weekly basis, and his trajectory is going to be dependent on what happens for a bad patient. It's not going to have anything to do with what an intensive management team's risk is going to do. So this is a real challenge with a risk-based model. We also are having problems, and this has been particularly true at some of the other sites, um, just getting a hold of the patients, which is the same thing that's been a theme for some of the other work. So, you know, of these patients we've received so far, um, we have um, found a lot of challenges in thinking about how we can go for outcomes in them. The central office group that runs the study is now allowing us to take 10% of our patients as referrals. I can tell you, we of our 100 patients we have to date, we are running close to 40 referrals right now, which is way more than our 10%. But they seem to be the right patients at the right time, and I'm real curious how this is going to come out in the wash. But this is, I think, truly indicative of some of the challenges there's going to be as we try to really dig into how these programs should run and what kinds of populations they should look at. Um, I'm going to go faster. A couple of things, a few things we've learned so far. We talked about the risk model. We realized that Jeffrey Brenner was right, that his criteria, which we modified slightly and are using now, seems to be quite good at picking up people who might actually be the right people at the right time. Um, this, so it's a, really a mixture of qu some quantitative and qualitative, but it's he triggers, their system in Camden triggers when you've had more than one admission in a year, okay? And because he's got 95% patients in Medicaid and he's got everybody in the system, he uses one healthcare you know, technologic thing he can, they can see when they're admitted. So they trigger immediately for evaluation when they hit two admissions. I think that's a good idea. They see the patients when they're admitted. We're trying to do that. Now, otherwise, just spend all your time trying to find the patients. Two or more chronic conditions and one, uh, three or more of these issues. So these things, both for Camden and for us so far, seem to be really important in identifying a population that you think you can intervene upon. So I think my biggest lessons learned is that just going with a cost model, just going with a risk-based model isn't probably going to get, or isn't, I think, going to get you where you want to go in terms of being able to address things that might actually lead to the decreased acute care utilization, decreased hospitalization, and ultimately the cost reduction that you're looking for. So I think this is very important. Of course, he's been doing this for four years now. I'd like to say that maybe you got it right. Um, we, will, we were interested to note that some of these were not high cost patients, even with these conditions. Um, so it's a nuance, but um, something, again, when you think about your goals, I think is important. Um, this gets you to be able to focus on the modifiable. Um, the other thing that we learned, and this was um, something that Dr. Brenner shared with us as well, he described the first year of his program, and he said they had this targeted group. These, some of them were these super users that are on that slide that I showed you about the big impact on cost. And he said, you know, they, they were able to engage some of them, and he had these really great nurses that were and social workers that were working really hard with these patients. And every, they didn't want, nobody wanted to let them go. They just wanted to keep going. You know, the patients loved these nurses, and they had these teams, and they just, you know, everybody sort of bonded, and they had these successes together, and they just kept going, and they couldn't enroll any more patients because they were so focused on the people that they already had. So he said, so what do, what do people do when you have something emotionally charged, you know, that it's really complicated for us as human beings, something that's emotionally charged, so what do we do about that? We hold a ceremony. And so what they did is they instituted graduation ceremonies. And I thought this was brilliant because I, we've already seen it, and um, Marie in particular, our medic, knows this. She has a one patient, well, really two patients now in particular, that think that she um, truly has saved their lives, which she may have done. I would give her credit for that. But they, um, they don't want to let go of her, and I think she doesn't want to let go of them. And we sort of talked about this the other day, and she had tears in her eyes, and I realized how important this lesson was from, from Brenner, that we have to go into this sort of thing with certain kinds of expectations that this is going to be something that we do that's short-lived. It can't be sustainable if we go on. And that the patients need to understand that as well. And that we'll get over that really hard part for those patients we have been able to help by putting a ceremony around that. So maybe it's time to start planning the first graduation, doing this for three months. Now. Um, we also know that many patients will be back. We have had folks that we tried to help a little bit. You know, that it's going to be okay for a little while. We know they're coming back. Um, this, I think, is a real concern. 
for me, um, you know, these, what we're getting, even from these lists, these referrals are the hardest, so the hard patients. There's a lot of psychosocial stuff, some very challenging behavioral issues, and I think we really need to be tuned into this. And I think this is important both from the sort of this graduation perspective to sort of help contextualize and limit the way we think about it. Um, and we're also um, really trying to focus and grow on um, some of the team care things that we know are important to present for now. And in due course, I mean, the hospice folks know how to do this. I mean, you can't work in hospice um, and not um, have special kinds of approaches for, for keeping yourself going. And I think that's going to be really important for this kind of program. Um, we have had so much psychosocial stuff, not a surprise, again, an urban population, a lot of drug use, a lot of alcohol, PTSD, other kinds of psychiatric illness um, that has been really um, critical for us and we found our mental health component to be much larger than we originally thought. Um, we think that home visits are critical, fits with the grace evidence. Um, it is um, hard to do. Uh, we had to learn that, the, I guess, the hard way. Um, there's a lot of training that has to go into it. The medics, you know, had had a variety of experiences before they came to this program. That still doesn't mean that they knew what to do about bed bugs, um, which we do have a lot of in Cleveland, especially it appears in some of our patient population. Um, how you handle safety in the community. Um, how you handle showing up at a patient's house who's actively using drugs, which um, we've had some interesting things, or a patient who refuses to wear pants, which was another problem that we've had. But these, are, these are all things, though, that you don't think about in home visits. The principle of home visits is perfect, is, is I think, very important. And if you can find a way to do it in a cost-effective way, I think it's, it's really critical. And it obviously, we've, we're very certain that it generates new knowledge about patients that we're just not getting in other Ways. So I think um, home visits for these programs are important. This idea of health information exchanges where you can see, like Brenner does, all the data for the care systems that we do, um, regardless of what patients are hospitalized. One of our patients has had 50 ED and uh, emergency uh, room and acute care hospitalizations around the city of Cleveland. Nine of those have been at the VA. I'm sure you guys would know who she was as well. Um, so these, you know, being able to share that information so you can truly coordinate care is really important. I know that um, University Hospitals is part of OHIP's Health Information Exchange. We at the VA are partnered with, um, in a different way, with um, Metro and then the Cleveland Clinic starting next week, but I think there'll be an opportunity within the next 9 to 12 months where we all really will be able to see um, health records through the computer um, in a seamless way, and I think that's going to be really important. Uh, I'm going to go very fast to the next couple of slides, and then maybe I'll show you a toy real quick that Marie has. Um, so I think we have to get better at identifying these patients. A, a risk-based model, regardless of how good it is, doesn't necessarily seem to find the right patients at the right time. I think if we really want to focus this then you have to be able to pull in other kinds of data, think about what's reversible, um, think about the psychosocial factors, which are very difficult to extract from the electronic medical record in an automated fashion. So how do you really identify this population so you can, from a, you know, a broader level, focus in and know where your, your money you're going to get your money, um, thinking about team-based care, thinking about how you use um, professionals that truthfully um, don't cost as much as a nurse, but may have a skill set that is very well suited for doing home visits. Um, how can we use those things? How do we work with technology to kind of um, uh, bridge these sorts of gaps? I have to tell you, so these are, these things, this flow thing and this Annie thing that I mentioned, these are, the flow is um, Florence Nightingale, it's the system that's used in the UK. Basically it allows you to text patients and you can set up with current text or you can do intermittent text, you know, take your methotrexate on Wednesdays, you can come every single Wednesday, or you can do more nuanced kinds of texting. There are some really good data on these programs. Um, people seem to like being texted, even when they know it's an automated program, they'll respond to the text, smoking cessation, um, a variety of other kind of chronic disease management, texting the future of medicine. Um, Annie is a program, a similar program that's being rolled out in the VA. It's named after Annie Fox, who is the nurse manager at Pearl Harbor, who um, was the first nurse to run a uh, Purple Heart. Um, all kinds of other kinds of technologic things that I'm not going to talk about. Here's my take home, and then I'll show you the toy real quick. Marie, do you want to come down and bring your toy? 
okay. It's okay. So this is what I want to say. Yeah, this is perfect. Um, taxonomy is important. Identifying the population, knowing that what you're talking, what you know, who you're talking about is important. Um, when you look at this literature that's coming out, especially the stuff that's in the popular press, pay spe special attending, attention to what they were doing in the sense of was this a cost-driven thing, was this a quality-driven thing primarily, and who are they focusing on? Um, think about health equity as a measure. Are we improving care for some, for everyone? I mean, are we thinking about broader changes in systems? And I think this is important because there are a lot of ethical kinds of questions in this. But ultimately, as we continue to move to value-based purchasing, whether it's in you know, bundled payments, ACOs, I don't think this is going away, the management of high-cost, high-complex patients, um, because we know if we target them correctly, we can save a lot of money. I, I think this is going to be around for a long time. So this is what we'd say, and I'll show you my toy. So this is something our medics are carrying. It's 4G, doesn't need a wireless connection satellite. And what they're doing with this is they go into the home, and you um, just got our fancy equipment, and they can do an entire visit with the patient not coming in. So the medics go into the home, they use this so that the patient can talk two-way with our nurse practitioner or our psychologist from their home. And um, the great news is that Medicare has decided out, you know, for outside the VA that this kind of work is reimbursed the same way as if you saw a patient face-to-face -face visit. It's just that we have the opportunity to get patients who don't necessarily aren't going to drive in on a snowy day or might be frequent no-shows that we know need coordination of care or um, you know, merely that we're worried about a safety issue. These setups actually come, we can hook a stethoscope to it. So you can, um, if Mary needs to hear, our nurse practitioner needs to hear the patient's heart, um, the medic can help assist that and she can hear it. I've done it myself. It here is as clear as day. It reminds me of old medical school when you're sitting in the auditorium and there are blasts and over. But it's happening from East Cleveland into the VA. Um, it has blood pressure cuffs, um, to temperature, pulse ox, you name it. We can do it all automated. So that's I think I'm going to stop. Are there questions? <laughs> that was terrific. Uh, what is the defense value? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Cheaper than you would think. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I always uh, wondered is if you look at managed care organizations and accountable care organizations, they're frequently in the private sector um, uh, catalog potentially by uh, cost per member per month. Okay. You started off by saying the VA has 8 million patients with 55 million a year. Okay. Does the VA quantitate uh, in, in that way and use that as a budget? Um, mechanism to uh, control or reduce costs okay. because remembering value is uh, outcome divided by cost. Right. The VA uses a, um, an algorithm that's called VERA that's honestly a little bit dated. Um, what it does is divide patients up into multiple different cost groups and each of those cost groups is based on certain criteria, clinical criteria that are related to what is expected to be the cost for your care. So it's essentially a form of abundant payment. So if you are trying transplant patient, for example, or you have chronic hepatitis C and receiving therapy, you're going to fall into a particular cost group and you'll be reimbursed based on that cost group regardless of what happens to you. Does that make sense? Um, and there are some nuances to that system that are, are going to have to be changed. Some of that doesn't necessarily reimburse, and as you can imagine, proactively some of the kind of wellness and preventative care that still makes sense for the VA um, in these cost groups. But overall, it means that we're still incentivized to try to find ways to keep those highest group things from using up the whole package. Okay. And then the other, the other question I have is providers, a lot of these intervention uh, programs make us feel good about ourselves as the doctors to uh, help patients. The, the, the issue is the, really the durability of the uh, uh, program. And you mentioned the difficulty of uh, imposing graduation on a program. Is there an intervention program that is, you know, a finite period of time that works over a long period of time in the VA or elsewhere? Um, not that I know of. Honestly, um, you know, we've 
it, this is one of the unanswered questions. I think, you know, Brenner's, there's some data from Brenner to suggest that, but again, it's targeted at a particular group of very high-risk patients that account for a ton of cost. So I think if you can find, and I've got to give the example, we have this patient who has had 50 ED raises and hospitalizations, and the team has done a tremendous amount of work for, with her. She's been very challenging, but she hasn't been hospitalized, not going to bite my tongue, since October. So, uh, right. yeah. so, does that mean she's going to stay out of the hospital for bed? You know, I'm not that naive. I know that's not the case, but there may still be some reduction in cost for the short term. But I think the questions you ask are really important, and the literature at this point doesn't have an answer. So we have time for one more question, and I'm sure that Brooke will uh, uh, be uh, 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 able to sure. continue the dialogue up front. Any, Stefan, Gravenstein? Yeah, so the obvious question is, you know, the strategy we use is doing more hands-on care and outreach. But the question is, to retire them from your program, the patient's behavior itself has to change. What have you been doing to change? Yeah, this is this is the this is the, the, the million dollar question. This is behavior and this is behavioral health intervention. So we're lucky within the VA because we are you know an integrative system. So our goal is this team, which we are thinking we sort of conceptualize as a SWAT team, like we're gonna try to zip in at this time when really bad things are going down and try to fix that. But the long term things that have to happen, like engagement and care, are gonna have to happen in other environments. So what we do, like our mental health provider does not act as the primary mental health provider for that patient. We help coordinate care or set up care in certain situations with someone who's going to continue to do that work with the patient as a long term. We um, have a pilot program in our VA that's doing a, a lot of peer counseling, which I, I know Dr. Benson, you're familiar with, a lot of community, sort of community health work. We have seen from that program already some very positive results, and it's particularly interesting for us in the VA because it's another opportunity to hire veterans. You don't have to have a lot of skill. We teach you some you know, health coaching kinds of behaviors. Um, you don't cost a lot of money. You're not a licensed care provider, but we can pin you to a patient in a way that provides this long-term interaction to help with behavioral change that we think is so important. So our part is just this piece, but it's really the time together. And truthfully, that's some of what Brenner's done, is just try to build this net of social services so that when his team moves out, the patient has a, a, a home, a medical home, or at least a sense of where they would like to engage with the care. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. On that, I want to thank uh, Dr. Watch for a really terrific